video I'm going to cover how to do a binomial, so two categories, simultaneous uh, logistic regression. So we're only going to have two outcome variables, um, or one outcome variable with two levels, and then um, several predictors, and uh, we're going to do this as simultaneous, so it's all at once and no steps. Right. So in log, you need to make sure that your DV is a group variable uh, or membership classification. And then uh, your IVs can be a mix of either categorical or continuous um, variables. And so you can pick how to, to uh, use them. And SPSS will actually dummy code them for you, which is really fantastic because you don't have to do it yourself. All right, so binary logistic has only two outcome categories. Multinomial logistic has three or more. There's several different types of those. So there's um, simultaneous or direct logistic, which you do all the variables at once. Uh, sequential or hierarchical, where you enter the variables in steps. Statistical, sometimes called stepwise, where you um, let the program choose the order of the variables for you based on uh, largest predictor first or last. And then there's actually probit regression, which is sort of halfway between log and a purely categorical um, continuous I, uh, DV. And so it works best on scales that are sort of half and half, like those Likert scales. Now for power, um, there's not really a good way to do this in G power. And so the sort of the best estimate is to do it as a regular regression. And um, you could also do it as, as discriminant, um, which has less assumption or more assumptions than log, but uh, is sort of in here as MANOVA. Um, but I'm going to estimate it using a regression type analysis. So I'm going to go to test family and choose F. And I'm going to do linear multiple regression deviation from zero. So it is still regression. It is not linear. It's logistic. Uh, and this will be like kind of a good starting place. There are other ways to estimate for log that will be um, more correct, I would say, but not as fast. So if you want kind of quick and dirty estimate, this is how you can convince G power to do it. For this example, I'm going to leave my effect size as a medium effect size. Uh, and remember, that's the overall um, predictive ability. So this would be like R squared. Um, but translated into F, if you hit determine, you could enter R squared. Uh, alpha is always 0.05. Beta is 0.8. And then number of predictors. So this will be the number of variables we're using to predict category, which in this example is nine. And hit calculate. So that means I need 114 people. So one of the considerations on log is you need to make sure that your outcome grouping is not uh, terribly imbalanced. So you don't want 80-20. Um, so 80% of people in one group and 20 in another. Because then it becomes uh, much harder to predict the, the smaller percentage group just because they're a smaller percentage. So the closer you can get to 50-50, the better. Um, now that's not always possible, but the further away you get from that, the harder it's gonna be to run a regression and you're just gonna need more people um, because it's sort of hard to predict the smaller group always. All right, we'll talk about coding and what all these numbers mean as we go, but there are lots of different pieces to log. Um, and so the example I have got here, I think is from Tabachnik and Fidel. So let me close this. Where we have, um, we're going to predict their work status. So are they working or are they not working? We're going to predict that with their children, which is a yes or no variable. Their race or ethnicity, which is a white or non-white. Uh, and then some continuous variables, locus of control. So internal versus external locus of control. Attitude towards marriage, higher scores are positive. Attitude towards the role of women, higher scores are positive. Socioeconomic status, attitudes towards housework, so higher scores are positive. Age and education level, which is coded as number of years in school. So all those are continuous, and then we have two dichotomous variables uh, with children and race. Uh, so there aren't as many assumptions with log by a long shot. There are just a couple. 
And one of them, since this is still regression, now it's not linear regression, but it's still regression, we're still trying to predict the variance in the outcome, um, is that your variables are not super correlated. So uh, multicollinearity is still a concern. So I'm gonna check for that. So analyze, regression, oops, just kidding. Uh, correlate, bivariate. Uh, do so much regression in here, I got distracted. So I'm gonna pick the first um, set of variables because those are the ones I'm using. Move them over and then hit okay. Um, and let's look at all of the variables and make sure they're not super correlated. So just at Pearson's correlation here and make sure they're not over 0.9. Now 0.9 is the cutoff for multicollinearity. Um, but remember that at 0.7 you're going to have trouble because they overlap at 50% of the variance. So in scanning through all of these, I think the highest one is just 379, so we'll be okay. There's no... Um, there's not too much overlap before the variables. The other thing you have to be concerned with is case ratio or case size. And um, that's what I was talking about where you don't want the split to be too uneven in any of your categorical variables. So what I'm going to do is create myself a frequency chart. So go analyze, descriptives, and then frequencies. Move over any categorical variables, so kids, race, and your dependent variable work status. I'm gonna hit OK. So I get the little frequency tables. And you just wanna make sure that the there isn't a extremely small number of cases in one of the categorical options. And so this is definitely five or less. It's very similar to chi-square. You're gonna, it's just not gonna work for you. Uh, you don't want categories with zeros in them. Um, and then you would really rather the split be not even because you can't perfectly handle that, but the more people you have, it's better. So one problem we're gonna have with children and with race is that our um, percentages are not very good. Now we're over the minimum number of people in each category, but it might be a struggle with this variable because the majority of our sample is white and the majority have kids. So this may not be the best variable to use, but I'm mostly concerned with our outcome variable and it's a pretty even split, 53, 47. So that's good for us. Um, it's just that when you look at these, if they're not also fairly evenly split, they're not going to be good indicators because that means that, you know, 400 people are white and I got like nearly 400 people or a little over 400 people in my work status one. So it's going to be kind of hard to determine which, which one white goes with basically because um, it seems like it goes with both. So that is case size. You can also look at this when you run the analysis, but this is how you would do it outside of the analysis. And that's pretty much it for log. I mean, those are the basic rules that they can't be super correlated and they can't have small frequency sizes. So let's run it. So analyze, regression, and then down here to binary logistic because we only have two outcomes. Multinomial logistic is three or more outcomes. <clears throat> Our dependent variable is going to be our categorical variable. <clears throat> so I'm going to move over work stat. That will automatically make whoever is coded as the lowest number group my comparison group. That's okay. And then I want to move over all of my IVs into covariates. So that is presence of children through years of schooling. I'm not using current marital status. Move that over. And if I wanted to get an interaction between two variables, basically if I wanted to do moderated log regression, I could highlight two of them and click A times B, and that will give me the interaction for them. Uh, because process does not, not really work with uh, categorical outcomes. Um, so this will do this for you. All right. Um, however, SPSS is gonna assume that anything you stick into this covariates box is continuous. So we need to click categorical and be sure to tell it which ones are categorical. Okay, so I did children and race. And then in the notes, I changed the indicator to first. So I'm gonna hit change so that they both say first. It does not actually matter uh, which one you do. You can pick if you want it to be first or last. You just need it to be the um, the basically dummy coded category to be the one you want to compare everybody else to. 
so this will compare them to the first category. That is more important for categories that are for variables that have three or more categories. You'll want to pick the one that you're most interested in, comparing every other category to. It's so kind of like in control group. Um, for two levels, this is just changing which way the sign goes. So if I did this analysis again and made it last, what would happen is the, the B values would go from positive to negative or vice versa, and the log odds would go from being very small to very large, if they're significant. So hit continue. Uh, the next thing we want to do is click on options. We're going to ask for classification plots. That'll tell us where people got classified, which is an important component of log analysis and the Hosmer Lem show. Um, and this will tell me if I am predicting people at the different um, ranks that they're at. And I'll get more into that in a second. Hit continue and then OK. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is create myself a document over here that ex reminds me of what all of my codings are. So we're going to talk about is the model significant, which is how we talked about regression. So is the overall model a better predictor of our outcome variable than chance. Okay. And then I'm going to ask which predictors are significant, which is kind of a post hoc. But this first set of outputs here is really what's going to help me figure that out. So the first thing you get is it tells you how many cases there are. So 465 people. And then this is the important part. So this dependent variable encoding. Um, just to help myself understand what's going on, I'm going to make myself a table with two columns. I'm going to write in who's my zero group. So working is our zero group. Not working is our one group. And so that will help me out when I'm going to figure out what all the, to interpreting the coefficients. Um, because anyone whose log odds scores are less than one, or the B values are negative, go into the zero group. Anyone whose log odd scores are um, greater than one or the B value is positive, go into the one group. Okay. That phone never rings, so we're just going to ignore it. All right. <clears throat> so next thing that you'll get is these categorical variable encodings. And so I'm just going to kind of make myself a little note right here. Talk, so race. White is our zero group, um, not white or non-white is our one group. And for kids, not kinds, kids, um, no is our zero group and yes is our one group. Um, I don't want to put that in my table yet because I'm not sure where they go, but that'll help me remember a little bit what those codings mean. You can also just scroll back up, but I'm just going to try to get it all together in one place. So that's an important box. This is a this parameter coding is especially useful when you have three or more categories. <clears throat> All right, so this is going to be very different than regression. The first thing you're going to get is called block zero. Okay, this is the y-intercept only model. Essentially, what that is is it tells me um, how useful just knowing the frequency table is at predicting categories. So generally what happens in this step is that everyone is dumped into one category, which is what you see here. So in this box, um, that tells me my classification. So overall, I got 52.9% correct, and that's here. Okay, so overall percentage, which means that I got all the working people correct. So working and working here, I got 100% of those right. So all people were classified as working. So I got 100% of those right. None were classified as not working. So I got no, no people right. And that's generally how block zero will go. It will stick people into the larger group. If the groups are evenly split, it's a 50-50 chance which one it goes into. Usually the lower coded group. And so you want this model to be non-significant because essentially you want to show that your predictors are better than a random coin flip guess or a guess in just knowing um, how many people are in each group. 
So we want our we want this model to be not significant, which is sort of weird, but you do. Okay. So it's a chi square. Just kind of pretend like that's in the proper format. And I'm going to list one degree of freedom here in the variables in the equation. And then under walled, so walled is the type of chi square here. I'm going to write this into my chi square box, so 1.57, and then use this p value here under sig. So this is not significant, which is good. Um, and then if we were to do this appropriately, it actually stick in chi. That doesn't always show up correctly on my Mac. There we go. <clears throat> so that is a non-significant block zero, which is great. The next thing we're gonna do is look at the Hosmer limb show. Okay. This is considered a deciles of risk, risk piece. Uh, oh, well, block one is next, but we can kind of skip down to here. This is the Merlin show test. So what this does is it calculates, given your predictors, it calculates the odds of each person being in group one, um, and then uh, ranks them in order and breaks them into deciles. So that's what this step one through ten piece is here. And it figures out how many people were in each decile for just working or just are not working. And then given those deciles, it figures out how many people I would have guessed would have been in that decile. So this is a chi-square analysis. It says, here's the people, how they're ranked. Here's how I would have expected them to be ranked. So this is another one where you'd want it to be non-significant because you want the people to be ranked in a way that you would have expected them to be ranked given your predictors. So you want this to be non-significant. The, um, the ranks were as I expected. So I'm going to fill that in. Here's degrees of freedom here. So 8. And then we got 2.39. And our p-value is not significant, which is great. And so what this contingency table does is it sort of tells me maybe where I'm the most discrepant. So if I looked at the difference between observed and expected, I could see, like, maybe there weren't enough people at the bottom or maybe there weren't enough people in the middle um, and sort of try to uh, see where I am missing folks. Like I might be predicting really well at the average um, of my scores, but maybe not in the tails. <clears throat> the last component to... Um, telling if the overall model is significant is looking at block one statistics, which is the addition of your predictors. So it sort of runs like a hierarchical regression, but not quite. This isn't hierarchical, it always gives you block zero, but you have to have something to compare your predictors to. Normally we talk about testing R squared difference from zero, but this gives it a, a starting point. So with just the y-intercept, how good am I? Now, if I add these predictors, how much better is that? So you want this to be significant. <clears throat> so let's see here. So I'm going to use this overall test of model coefficients. This is the overall analysis, not the individual coefficients. And we're going to use chi-square. You'll notice all three of these are the same. That is true because we're running a um, direct logistic uh, and not stepwise or hierarchical. So they're all the same when you do that. Uh, let's see, it's going to be 9, uh, oops, 9 degrees of freedom, it's 55.7, and P is significant. Great. That means we are predicting better than this um, block zero model. There is a form of chi-square that we can use here. It's going to be, um, not sorry, uh, R-squared, not chi-square. Be pseudo r squared because it is not actually real r squared <clears throat> and this is sort of a pretty like how good am i at predicting people's scores okay so i can look at the classification table but this gives me a number that i'm familiar with if i'm used to regression okay. so we'll get two options in spss cox and snell and nagel kirk most people use nagel kirk cox and snell was sort of the original r square 
but it would never um, be equal to 1. So if I predicted every one perfectly correct, the r squared should be 1, because I've gotten everybody right. Um, but the way that Cox and Snell is calculated, it just would um, level off and never reach 1. So the Nagel-Kirk r squared is an adjustment on Cox and Snell to solve that problem. So most people use Nagel-Kirk. Um, it's also usually bigger, which everybody likes bigger effect sizes, so 0.15. Same rules apply uh, that we've been talking about, so that's a medium effect size. All right. Um, the last thing I want to add is my classification table. So how good am I doing at predicting people, and who am I doing better for? So here. Hopefully it's better than the first try. So for the classification table, I've got overall, I am getting 63.9% correct. So 64% of the people correct. The reason the model is significant is because that is significantly better than 50%. So 50% would be chance, so it's coin flip. For my working group, I'm classifying 67% of them correct. For my not working group, I'm classifying 60.3% of them correct. Okay, that's much better than the zero I got last time. So on both of those blocks, you'll want to talk about um, if the overall model is significant, so chi-square, and then you'll also talk about the classification table, so where are you getting people correct. Now it looks like we've uh, done much worse at predicting working people. We were getting those 100% correct. But that's kind of false because um, it just, uh, in the, the y-intercept only model, it just sticks everybody in one group. So of course you're going to get 100% of people correct if you guess that everybody's in one of the groups. So 67% is better than chance, which is 50%. All right, the last thing we're going to do is look at the variables in the equation here. And that's where my little table comes in. Now, this is not something that people publish normally. It's just a way to help you think about um, and interpret your results. So the way this works, scroll over a little bit here, is everybody who's in the zero group, this is how people end up in the zero group, are, it's going to be negative b values and um, less than one log odds values. Because here's how it works. It takes the um, calculation of the regression equation and raises it to the exponential, which makes it log, and so ends up with a ratio of the odds of you being in the one group over the odds of you being in the zero group. Okay, so one over zero. If the number is less than one, mathematically, so let me give you kind of an example here. So let's say working, your odds of working, being in the working group was 0.75, and your odds of being in the not working group was 0.25. Make the math easy. It calculates the odds of the one group, so not working, divided by the odds of the zero group, so working, so that's going to be smaller than one. It's a small number. If those were reversed, well, it's larger than one. But just think about it. Like, if the odds of me being in the working group are 0.75, and the odds of me being in the not working group are 0.25, that's pretty clear which group I should be in, right? Um, if the odds of me being uh, in the not working group are 0.75, that's very clear. But it doesn't really show you that. It gives you an exponential b value. And so all that means is it's um, things that are smaller than 1 are, peop are more likely to be in group 0. Um, things that are larger than 1 are more likely to be in group 1, okay, which sort of maps on to your understanding of like less than 1 should be closer to 0, greater than 1 should be closer to 1. Um, if you're right on 1, that means the odds are 50-50. So it means you have a 1 to 1 odds, or the odd ratio is 0.5 to 0.5. Um, and that implies that you don't know which group people should be in, you're just guessing. So what I'm going to do first, uh, okay, sorry, so that means that over here, that's nice, <clears throat> I'm going to write in uh, positive B values and greater than one log odds, it's not adds. So for my significant variables, 
I'm going to fill in who goes on each side. So let's look at children first. So I've got children here. The B value is positive. My log odds or exponent B is larger than one. So that means they go over here. Um, for race, the B value is negative and my log odds are very small. So that means it goes over here. Control is not significant. Um, attitudes towards the role of marriage is not significant. So they are not useful predictors. So you see how close to one they are. Um, attitudes towards the role sorry, flip, 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 <clears throat> of women is significant. And so I'm going to write that one over here. because it is a positive score and it's over one. Um, the next one now, socioeconomic status, is a positive score and it's over one. So that goes over here as well. And then attitudes towards role housework is not significant. Um, age is significant here and it's negative and less than one. So it goes over here. <clears throat> and education is negative and less than one so it goes on this side and so that will give me a place to start in interpreting these uh, coefficients and you can just say the rest of them are not significant so let me think about this so for race um, when you're interpreting categorical predictors in a categorical regression essentially you're talking about the times when this is coded as one so let me quick switch back to the output. You'll see how next to it has the little one. And that means that for the one group for race, here's what group it matches for your DV. So the one group for race, which is why I wrote this down a minute ago, is not white. So the interpretation here is that um, non-white white participants are working and vice versa. White participants are not working. Okay, so all of this is true that like it, you know, as uh, for race, not white participants are working, non um, uh, white participants are not working. So the, the con uh, reverse is true. For age, as age increases, you are working. So we're interpreting all of these as as they go up, you are more likely to be in this group. And then as education increases, you are working. And those both make sense. Like older people are more likely to be working than young people who might be in college or just in school. And as education goes up, you're also more likely to be working. So those make sense. Um, so for the not working group, we're going to interpret this as the one variable. So this is, yes, we have kids. So people who have kids are less likely to be working because they're at home taking care of them. Okay. So people who don't have kids are more likely to be working. Attitudes towards the roles of women. Okay, so more positive attitudes is um, more likely to not be working. Okay. Um, and that one I'm not totally sure because you would think with more positive attitudes you'd be women in the workforce, but people have more positive attitudes towards um, the roles of women or more likely to not be working in this data set. And then this one makes perfect sense. As SES goes up, so you have a higher socioeconomic status, you're less, um, you're more likely to be not working. Okay. So as you have more income uh, or more uh, affluency, you are less likely to be working, which also makes sense because you don't have to work, you have the money. Okay. Um, so think about all of these as as that thing goes up, this is the group they're going to go into. Remembering that categorical variables, as they go up, means they're in the one group. And when you get dummy coded variables, you'll have to, it'll be the comparison between the zero group and the one group. Um, and I have a, we'll have an example of that in the um, um, hierarchical log. All right, so what else from here? There's one more thing you can look at that's not an assumption, but it's sort of one of those things that you're supposed to check. It's called outliers in the solution. 
So here, this is our uh, predicted probabilities. You can also save the probabilities in, uh, in SPSS to make sure, to look at who these people are because you can't quite double click on them and get point the dot out like you can um, with the scatter plots. But here is everybody and their probabilities predicted. So it creates you a probability of being in the, um, the one group. Uh, and then so 1 minus the probability of being in the 1 group is the probability for the 0 group. And so at here, at 50-50, this is where it splits people in half. It makes a decision. So everybody up to this point, that's what these W's stand for, is in the working group. And everybody past that point here, these little N's, stand for the non-working group. So we have a W way out here at point, basically point 0.9 that they should not be working who is working. So why is this person so far out here? What is it about them that makes them look like they're not working more than they're working? And then we also have some ends over here. So you're basically looking for people on the extreme ends of the distribution. You will always have a mix of scores here in the middle because sometimes it's just hard to predict people who are kind of on the fence. Um, but you want to sometimes figure out, okay, what is it about these people here at the ends that I can't seem to get correct? and see if maybe you're missing a variable uh, that you could use to help you better predict people in their categories. So that is log regression. What kinds of things do you need to report this? Well, you need to talk about um, an APA. You want to talk about each of the different uh, blocks and their classification tables. You want to talk about your predictors. And what I always do is take this gigantic um, variables in the equation box and just include all of that. So I get B, standard error, walled, which is chi-square, p-values, and exponent Bs, and put all of that in a table so you're not writing tons of different chi-square numbers in your text. And that leaves you a lot more room to just sort of interpret the variables, which is the main point of this analysis anyway. So that is a complete example of a binary, direct, or simultaneous logistic regression.